My pony's a little wild today. Hi guys, if you are new here, hi. Hello, welcome, my name is Sarah and what I'm doing is what everyone is doing. <laughs> I am telling a true crime story, a crew crime story, excuse me, and I'm putting my makeup on at the same time. In today's episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Wow, that was a lot. Sorry about that. In today's episode of Crew Trime, this is the story of Polly Class. <laughs> this one's a doozy, you guys. A doozy. Hold on to your butts. Let's just get to it. If you're interested in any of the makeup or my earrings or any anything that you see here on camera, it will all be listed down in the description box. On October 1st, 1993, in Petaluma, California, 12-year-old Polly Hannah Class was having a slumber party when a strange man kidnapped her at knife point out of her own bedroom. When Polly Class was kidnapped, I was exactly her same age. Before then, it was only what I'd seen in horror movies that scared me. I was more worried about Pennywise, the clown popping out of my shower drain. <laughs> Here I am, Weezy. Then I was of a real adult stranger appearing in my bedroom in the middle of a slumber party at that. This story is one that has stuck with me over the years and I know that this has ignited the crew crime fire in a lot of other gals of our age. So what happened? I'm gonna tell you. Polly Class was a very bright and friendly 12 year old sixth grader at Petaluma Junior High School. She played the clarinet, she got straight A's, and she hung out with her best friends, Jillian and Kate. And on October 1st, 1993, they decided to have a little sleepover at Polly's house. Jillian arrived at about 7 p.m. and the girls sat on the front stoop eating popsicles while they waited for Kate to arrive. The neighborhood that Polly lived in in Petaluma was perfectly normal. Polly lived with her mother, Eve, and her six-year-old sister, Annie. And Polly's parents had been divorced since she was like little, little, but she did have a really good relationship with her dad. You know, he was around, they just weren't all together. So around 10 p.m., Polly's mom and her youngest sister, Annie, laid down for the night. But the three girls were hanging out in Polly's room doing sleepover things, you know. You guys remember how that was at that age, you know? Lots of listening to cassette tapes on your boombox. <laughs> Maybe playing with some makeup. Definitely playing Nintendo. Staying up super late, you know, that kind of thing. Around 10.30, Polly got up to grab the girl's sleeping bags from the living room. When she opened up her bedroom door, there was a man standing in the dark hallway. And at first, the girls, they thought it was some kind of a prank, you know? It was October, Halloween season. So the man had a large kitchen knife in his hand and he said to the girls, don't scream or I will slit your throats. Now inside Polly's bedroom with the door closed, the man made the girls lie face down on the floor. He said, don't look at me. I'm not gonna hurt you if you do what I say. He calmly tied up Jillian and Kate using the Nintendo cables. He gagged them with silky cloths, like, like a torn up nightgown or like a slip. He put pillowcases over their heads and told them to count to a thousand and by the time they were done, Polly would be back. So it seemed like he was taking Polly to show him where the valuables in the house were. And she pleaded with him to not hurt her mother and sister. And she offered up the cash that she had stashed away in her bedroom. We know now that that man was Richard Allen Davis. Now Davis had a super long criminal record that went back to the 60s. And in fact, by the time he entered his teens, he had already been deeply involved in all kinds of crimes. Burglary, forgery, drug use, drug possession, kidnapping, grand theft. I mean, you name it. This guy was bad news. So he had recently just been paroled a few months earlier after serving eight years of a 16 year sentence after kidnapping a woman and forcing her to withdraw like $6,000 from her bank account. All right, so back in Polly's bedroom, Jillian and Kate were counting, but when they heard the screen door shut, they got busy trying to untie themselves. They were like standing back to back, trying to help each other. And one of the girls was able to bring her hands under her feet to get free. So then they ran into Eve's bedroom and woke her up, Polly's mom, and she immediately called the police. Now, nothing else from the home was taken. Well, except for Polly and a pair of Annie's red tights. 
the police arrived pretty much immediately and the search for Polly was on. And investigators combed through Polly's bedroom, collecting fingerprints, fibers, anything and everything that they could. Now that same night, but about 20 miles away in Santa Rosa. For context, I didn't even explain where Petaluma is. Petaluma is in Sonoma County. I think it's in Sonoma County. It might be in Marin County. Anyways, it's north of San Francisco in Northern California. All right, any hoosies. That same evening, about 20 miles north of Petaluma in Santa Rosa, Shannon Lynch was driving home from babysitting at a home on Pythian Road when she noticed a white Ford Pinto stuck in the ditch. Now, now the home on Pythian Road was like a private driveway, so there, there's no reason that this car should have been there. So there was a man that kind of flagged her down. Well, so there's conflicting accounts of their encounter, you know? So some of the reports say that she stopped the car and asked the guy, like, what are you doing here? What's your business? And then other accounts say that he kind of flagged her down to help him. But at any rate, they did exchange some words, but basically he was trying really hard to get her out of the car to help him. And she was like, not today, Satan. She said the man looked wild. He smelled really bad. <laughs> and his shirt was like inside out, disheveled. Okay, creep vibes. Hang on, I gotta get this eyebrow on. I cannot, I can do everything else, but I cannot do the brows. <laughs> Okay, anyways, so Shannon did not get out of the car. Smart girl. Well, she told that creepy dude that the homeowners would definitely call the police if they saw him, and then she peeled out of there. So she drove about two miles, and then she stopped at a payphone. Remember those? Do you remember never actually putting money in the payphones? You would just call like 1-800-COLLECT, and when it asked you what your name is, you'd be like, I'm at the mall, mom, come pick me up, and hang up. Anyway, okay, anyways, so Shannon called the homeowner, the person that she had been babysitting for, her name was Dana Jaffe. She told her, you know, what was going on. She warned her basically, like, there was a very sketchy dude pretty close to her house and it's late at night, right? And Dana was like, nope, not doing this shit. She grabbed a baseball bat and her young daughter and they bounced out of there. As they were driving away from the house, they saw the white Pinto, but it was unoccupied. They never saw anyone, no wild man. So Dana called the police for assistance, of course, and she met them near the end of the private driveway. By now, it's around midnight and the Sonoma County Sheriff's deputies arrived. The sheriffs were not aware of that kidnapping situation happening in Petaluma, just 20 miles away, because the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department used a different radio frequency. So they, they had no idea that the man driving the Pinto exactly fit the description of this kidnapper. Okay, so Dana is away. She went somewhere else. The police are now engaging with the wild man in the white pinto, okay? The reports say that he was disheveled. He had alcohol on his breath. He had like leaves and things all stuck in his crazy wild hair. And it looked like he'd been like rolling around in the grass. So the police took his driver's license and they ran the information and it returned a clean driving record. Nothing suspicious. So they had no reason to detain him. And in my research, it says that they administered a field sobriety test which he passed. It also said that they had asked him if he had been drinking because they saw some like beer cans in his car and he took one out and started drinking it in front of them. They were like, sir, you can't, no, you cannot do that. And they made him pour it out. Why didn't they arrest him? I don't know. The sheriffs filled out a field interrogation card with pretty much just his name, Richard Allen Davis. That's who it was. Did I, did I say that? It was Richard Allen Davis that was later filed. Davis explained to the sheriffs that he was out sightseeing, he got lost and he was using that driveway to turn himself around, but then he got stuck. And he had tried to get under the car to free it, which is why he was all sweaty and dirty and covered in leaves and grass. But the cops were like, they did not feel like they had a reason to detain him and they wanted Miss Jaffe to be able to get rid of this dude. She told sheriffs that she didn't, she wasn't trying to like cause a fuss, she just wanted him to go away. The sheriffs helped get his car out of the ditch and then they waved as he drove off into the night. Can you believe that? It is worth noting, however, that when this whole thing happened, just about two-ish hours after Polly was abducted in Petaluma, 20 miles away, and when the sheriffs encountered him, he was alone in the car. There was no sign of anyone else. Okay, so now Polly's missing. 
She's been gone for almost two days. Polly's father, Mark Class, got a phone call and the voice sounded just like Polly. It was a very short call and she said on the phone that she was in a hotel room somewhere and her abductor had left her for just a moment and then the line went dead. Well, Mark's phone was not set up to, you know, trace phone calls at that time. And there wasn't anything that they could do to figure out where it came from. All they could do really was to wait and hope that there would be another phone call. So as the days went on, the search for Polly quickly spread beyond California. It was a national sensation. Do you guys remember this case? I do. It was 1993, remember? So the internet was truly in its infancy, right? It just, it like, wasn't a thing. You couldn't just tweet about the case to get it to catch fire, you know? No, this recovery effort truly took a lot of teamwork. Within just days, really, 50,000 flyers had been printed and distributed all over. Now, this case was one of the first ones that utilized, you know, kind of internet capabilities, even as limited as they were. Gary French and Bill Rhodes from, from Petaluma, they digitized Polly's missing poster, and another guy, Larry Magrid, helped to distribute the poster through multiple networks, which helped to show it to like 20 million users, which was an incredible feat in 1993. The local area, like the ground search, it covered over a thousand square miles of apple orchards, fields, and redwood forests. And again, for the first time, the search areas were recorded on uh, computer-aided design maps. So the people in Petaluma and the surrounding communities formed the Poly Class Search Center. They were determined to find her. Almost 4,000 volunteers worked tirelessly, 24 hour schedule, to coordinate with local police and FBI to answer phones, track the search areas, receive tips, stuff envelopes, manage special events, vigils, all of that. It was a huge operation and it was like all locally funded, right? Local businesses don't donated everything. The chairs, the tables, the phone lines, the supplies, local restaurants and residents donated all of the food and drinks to the volunteers. Thousands of search posters were faxed to truck stops and to supermarkets all over the country. In all, there was like 54 million flyers distributed nationwide with Polly's photo and the police, you know, the artist sketch of the kidnapper. So you remember that phone call that Mark Class received? Well, another call came and this time they were ready. It sounded but again, like Polly, the call was short, but it was long enough for the FBI to actually trace it. They found the location. It was coming from a house about 30 miles away. So they responded immediately. They swarmed the house, but when they got inside, she wasn't there. No sign of her. It was just a regular family, you know? And when police sat them down and spoke with them, they didn't know what they were talking about. But one of the young daughters confessed that she made the calls. Two of her little shithead friends at school had dared her to do it. Damn it. Everyone heard about this case. Everyone was looking for her. And the search continued for almost nine weeks. Even Petaluma native Winona Ryder offered a $200,000 reward for the safe return of Polly Class. Now with that reward on the table, another phone call came in demanding $10,000 in ransom. FBI traced the phone call to an apartment in Petaluma and this time a SWAT team responded. And once again, it was some young shithead who made a prank phone call. This time it was 20 year old James Hurd and he was arrested for extortion and posing as a kidnapper, which I didn't know that was a crime. Posing as a kidnapper? Anyway, the search for Polly was huge and the class family was very discouraged at this point. They even published a letter in the San Francisco Examiner, the newspaper. It was published on in the October 17th, 1993 edition. And the letter was directed to Polly, you know, telling her to stay strong and that they loved her and we, they would never stop looking for her things like that. And they also addressed the kidnapper saying, quote, wherever you are, whoever you are, please return Polly to her family. Now on November 28th, 1993, a whole two months after Polly disappeared, Dana Jaffe, remember that smart lady who lived at the end of the private road? She was kind of surveying her property after she had some tree work done. She found a pair of red tights, you know, little girl's red tights, and all tangled up in them was 
hair, like head hair, like long hair. She found a few strips of like packing tape and a few other odd things and all of the red flags started going off for her. So the area wasn't that far where she had saw that white pinto that night in October. So could that creep from that night have been the guy from the police sketch that was everywhere? Now remember when, when Dana saw that car that night, it was empty and she never actually saw his face. She only met with police, you know, a distance away to make the report of the trespasser. She looked around a little bit more and she found like, like an, a silky cloth, a dark colored men's sweatshirt that was inside out. That was enough. She called the police. When investigators arrived and really combed over the area, they found a lot more. They, okay, they found a condom, unrolled condom, the wrapper to the condom, beer six pack holder, empty beer, bottles and cans, and a book of matches. And the silky cloth that they discovered matched the silky cloth that was recovered from Polly Class's bedroom. So when investigators reviewed the police calls that were made the day of the kidnapping, they turned up that contact card with Richard Allen Davis that they completed that night at Dana's house. We know that Richard Allen Davis is a hot bag of trash, but when they stopped him that night, it only pulled up his driving record. It didn't connect his criminal record. I mean, you can look it up yourself. It's pages and pages and pages. And there's a lot of repeat things. Kidnapping, assault, assault with the intent to commit rape, burglary, assault with a deadly weapon, just like the number of times you see kidnapping. Like what? Eyes wide open, right? They know who they're dealing with. And they discovered that Davis was actually in violation of his parole terms, so they were able to arrest him. And when he was initially questioned, he totally denied any involvement with the situation with that girl that was kidnapped in Petaluma. But while they had him in custody, they kept digging through the evidence. Now, his mugshot matched the description in the case, the incident that occurred at Dana Jaffe's property that night that Polly disappeared put him in the location where they found the tights and the other evidence that connected him to Polly Class's bedroom. Both of Polly's friends, Jillian and Kate, were easily able to pick him out of a police lineup. And the most major evidence, police had recovered a partial palm print in Polly's bedroom. It was a match. It matched his palm print. Well, while police had Davis in custody, they held him in solitary confinement and he didn't have access to media or anything like that. So, so he didn't know the status of anything that was going on. And investigators continued to search the area and there was no indication of human remains. Now the connection that the police were able to make with the palm print was released in the media and he didn't find out until a friend came to visit him and brought a newspaper with that headline, well shit. He had been denying involvement the whole time, remember. Once he realized he was pretty much backed into a corner, he wanted to make a deal. So on December 4th, 1993, Richard Allen Davis confessed. He said that he had gone, well, I guess I can't do my lips and also talk at the same time either, can I? He said that he had gone to Petaluma that day to ask his mother for some money. He couldn't find her, but he did encounter a man in the park who asked him if he wanted to buy a joint, which he did. He said he smoked the joint and it must have been laced with PCP because whatever happened after, his brain is just like too foggy to recall it. He then decided to randomly choose a house. He recalled breaking into the house through an open window and he heard girls' voices coming from a bedroom and he remembers being in the bedroom and tying up the girls and then he blacked out. And then he flash forwards to he's driving along in his car and he has Polly class in the car with him. Confused about what he should do, he continued to drive around, he got lost, and then he got stuck in Dana Jaffe's driveway. He took Polly out of the car with only her hands bound, and then he left her on a nearby hillside. Then he had the encounter with police, then he later returned to retrieve Polly. So she just sat there waiting for you to come back and get her? Uh, okay, Richard. So once he had Polly back in the car, he felt the only thing that he could do to avoid going back to jail was to get rid of her. So he strangled her and buried her body in a shallow grave just off of Highway 101 near an abandoned lumber mill in Cloverdale, which is about 30 miles from the nearest search site. He says he doesn't know why. 
he did it. Well, it's really no surprise that Richard Allen Davis was full of shit. Like that whole story is just not true because the day after Polly Class was kidnapped, he had to take a drug test for his parole officer, which he did, and he passed. So there was no joint, there was no PCP, there was none of that. When investigators asked if he had sexually assaulted Polly, he said, not that I recall. I don't think so. What? Well, investigators took Davis out to the burial site that he described and he pointed them in the direction of Polly's grave. He has refused to ever give a, like a real truthful account of the events, so it's not clear when Polly was killed, but many speculate that it was before the arrival of the deputies that night that his car got stuck in the ditch because when Dana left the house to go call police, she didn't see him, so he must have been away. You know what I'm saying? Polly's mostly decomposed and partially skeletized body was found underneath a piece of plywood and a blackberry briar. Forensic testing of her clothing could not determine if she had been sexually assaulted, but the evidence could have been just too degraded after being out in the weather for so long. The cause of death could also not be determined because of the condition of her body. Because of the incredible publicity of this case, the trial had to be moved out of Petaluma and it ended ended up in San Jose, which is, you know, just south. Jury selection was a major challenge because everybody knew about it and they had visceral reactions to Richard Davis. Mm -hmm. It took two years to get everything ready for trial and the prosecution pulled every witness you could think of to make their case. So after 10 weeks in the courtroom, Richard Allen Davis was convicted of first degree murder and four special circumstances, robbery, burglary, kidnapping, and attempting a lewd act on a child which he strongly denied, even in the courtroom. But the verdict was reached on June 18th, 1996, 10 counts in all, and the San Jose Superior Court jury recommended the death penalty. At the formal sentencing hearing, Davis, piece of shit, he read a statement saying that the last thing that Polly said as they walked up the hill was, Just don't do me like my dad. I have to pay my dues, so should Burn you. Burn hell, Davis. Fuck. Yeah, what? Are you fuck? Mark Class nearly took flight in that courtroom that day. He lunged at Davis and he had to be restrained and removed from the bailiffs. And Davis just like flipped him off. Hot trash. Okay. Leaky, leaky garbage hot garbage juice. On August 5th, 1996, Judge Thomas Hastings sentenced Richard Allen Davis to death by lethal injection, saying, A traumatic and emotional decision for a judge. You've made it very easy today by your conduct. So Richard Allen Davis is currently on death row at California's San Quentin State Prison. The appeals process has not yet been exhausted for him, so it will be a while before the sentence is carried out. He has survived multiple attacks and drug overdoses and is serving his time in solitary confinement. On June 1st, 2009, the California Supreme Court upheld the death sentence, but the death penalty in California is currently suspended. So that execution is not gonna be happening anytime soon. Richard Allen Davis is part of the reason for the Three Strikes Act that was signed into California law in 1994. Had his criminal activity been curtailed earlier in his life, Polly Class would be alive today. So also resulting from this case, a nationwide effort led by the Poly Class Foundation has resulted in all 50 states in the United States to have Amber Alert laws in place. Amber Alert is named for Amber Renee Hagerman, who in 1996 was abducted at age nine in Arlington, Texas. So when Amber Hagerman was abducted, her family approached Mark Class and the Polly Class Foundation to help publicize her case to help find her. Now the names vary a little bit, state by state, mostly named in memorial of other victims. But these alerts, Amber Alerts, give citizens, regular citizens, the opportunity opportunity to be aware of a child in danger and when appropriate to act to help save their life or aid in their safe return to their families. Since founding the Poly Class Foundation, and actually I, th I think it might be called a, a variation, I'll link everything down in the description box below if you're interested. And their efforts over the years have helped over 10,000 families recover their missing children. If you would like to get involved or if you would like just more information or maybe even to make a donation, please visit polyclass.org and their information will be linked down in the description box below. <coughs>
that's it. That is the story of Polly Class. And this one hits you know, because we're essentially the same age. I remember when this one was hot in the news and just thinking how freaky, freaky it is, man. Again, if you are interested in my makeup or anything else that you see me <laughs> wearing or anything that I talked about, it will all be listed down in the description box. So just go check that out. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on most of the other socials as well. If you're looking for more crew crime type content, make sure that you check that description box because I always list other creators and if you want to recommend somebody to me then just leave it in the comments so i guess that's it for now i will catch you next time in the next video bye state prison <sighs> so on to i need a lip brush the <laughs> and on their way out of definitely call the police when she pee well and on their way this guy can suck a bag of dicks god i really need to get my teeth cleaned they feel so gross like sweaters.